thank you very much for having me at uh, IIT Kampu uh, after a gap of three years. Um, I have been, it's, it's a privilege to be here again, and um, I look forward to sharing some thoughts with you on various aspects, manifestations of Indian civilization. And I have chosen deliberately some which are perhaps less usual, less classical, uh, than uh, you know uh, those which are usually discussed. Uh, you can see here the first uh, series, which uh, will go up to middle of September, and uh, this has been circulated. So I, I am not going to read out the list. Uh, but then from mid October, when we come back again, we will have uh, the last uh, uh, nine lectures. And uh, again, you can see that um, uh, what what I am going to try to do is not really to amass facts about India, because it's extremely easy to amass facts. Rather, it's to try to find out some important uh, lines of thought, lines of uh, development which India has followed. And uh, we will kind of explore the, what, he, what used to be called in classical studies the Indian genius. So in what way was it different? You see, every uh, ancient civilization is great in its own right, whether Egyptian or Greek or whatever. But the Indian civilization had certain specific features and developments of its own. So this is what I want to explore. Um, here below you have uh, details for those who would like to meet me outside the lectures. Uh, I've been given a, an office in the CAC. So you can, I will be there normally every morning and often in the afternoon too, it depends. So you're welcome. And um, I'm basically at your disposal also through mail if you wish. And uh, I always welcome Six zero four eight, not six zero four six, I'm sorry. It is six zero four eight, I'll correct that. Sorry. So thank you, Raj. So. So with this, uh, well, I think uh, uh, let, us, let us start. And um, let us start with something which lies at the beginning of Indian civilization. Of course, you can't really say when a civilization like India begins precisely. It's, it's a continuous development. And in fact, the latest findings uh, are that <clears throat> there is human presence in India datable, rigorously dated to 1.5 million years. This is in Tamil Nadu, near Chennai. But this is not Homo sapiens. This is probably some Homo erectus. And uh, this is rigorously dated. We had also similar dates in northern Pakistan. So we know that this subcontinent has been inhabited for a long time. Exactly when did Homo sapiens enter is still slightly controversial. But it is definitely somewhere between 50,000 and uh, 80,000 uh, years ago. So then you see you have a long development through what is called the Paleolithic uh, era. That is to say, people basically uh, hunt and gather food. And they move about constantly. They use stone tools, uh, which in fact uh, represents already a fairly evolved technology to be able to cut, chop uh, stone tools to the require uh, function that you have in mind is not at all a easy point. Uh, so this is a, a, a first techn human technology, you might say. And then, then the jumping through all the stages of the Paleolithic age and coming straight to something like uh, uh, 8 or 7 BC, and we will see uh, next week similar developments happening in the Ganges Valley also at about the same time. There is one major change, radical change, which is that perhaps because Paleolithic populations were expanding, uh, people started settling down. Now, for the first time, and this happens more or less at the same time all over the, uh, uh, all over the, the Middle East, Near East, and parts of Europe. Uh, for example, in Turkey, what was called Anatolia, we have also settled societies. Now we are entering the Neolithic age, new stone age, where the stone tools are going to be different. But the main radical difference is that uh, people settle down and start practicing agriculture. 
and uh, this is known, this used to be called uh, the Neolithic Revolution. And uh, with agriculture, you see the, then the, the story of uh, complex, more and more complex and rapidly evolving technologies uh, starts. Once you want to practice agriculture, you will be led to things like water management, water consumption. We need pots to carry water, to store your seeds for the next uh, sowing season. So you need ceramic technology and so on and so forth. Very soon, by about uh, 4,500 BC, metallurgy is going to appear in the Indian subcontinent. Again, more or less the same days as elsewhere. This would be copper and bronze technology, and we're going to see some of it because the Indus civilization is typically a Bronze Age civilization. Iron Age civilization will be in the Ganges Valley. We will see that, uh, I believe, uh, next uh, Tuesday. So, so these patterns are fairly well known, well established. There is um, uh, what remains still mysterious, you know, is is the the exact articulation of it all. What prompted people to to settle down? What prompted them once they had actually beautiful? And I'll, I'll start with this: uh, agricultural societies in Baluchistan, right from 7,000 BC, very well organized. Why did they feel the need to? build increasingly vast uh, trade networks, uh, eventually even with the regions outside India, even in Neolithic times. Uh, why did they, one, I, I, we cannot say one fine day, because it doesn't happen in a day, but it happens over just a century or so, which is a very brief period of time. Why did people uh, feel the need to uh, uh, create cities? You see, you have, first of all, villages, then growing villages which turn into towns, but then the phenomenon of a city is something radically different because you have a state, you have an administration at work, uh, you have <coughs> things like writing, like a bureaucracy, keeping records, uh, you have advanced technologies, you have uh, certain features which we'll see here like sanitation and so on. So this is a new phenomenon altogether. We cannot always you know, pinpoint exactly why it happened, where it happened also, uh, uh, first of all. But let us start, and this is a view of Dholavira, which uh, we will return to. This is in Gujarat. I'll come back to it. And uh, this is, in fact, this beginning at, in Baluchistan. Uh, these are among, at present, possibly the earliest uh, dates we have of a society that will evolve in continuity all the way to the Indus civilization 4,000 years later. So here there is a continuity of cultures. And you see here at the top right, uh, already well organized and uh, possibly even planned uh, house settlements in a deep Neolithic era. There's no metallurgy now. There's only agriculture, stone tools, that's all there is. And people are already quite organized. In fact, bottom left is a, a set of granaries, and there are lots of them at Mehergar in Baluchistan, where you see um, these small boxes of approximately one meter by one meter, where people stored grain. And uh, we know that they stored grain because uh, the, 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 these boxes, these containers, were lined with the solution of clay, uh, which was meant to keep dampness uh, out and um, also possibly to preserve the grain from insects. So now if you have a granary, it means that you have a collective harvesting. You see, the, the harvest is stored collectively. And then, of course, the distribution of the grain also is going to be collect collective. So this requires actually quite a fairly advanced uh, uh, stage of development uh, um, of this society, which begins about 7,000 BC. So this is one of the antecedents, undeniably, of the Indus civilization. But now we will jump to the main stage. What really is of interest to us is the urban stage of the Indus or Harappan or Indus Sarasvati civilization. I'll explain why Sarasvati in the course of this uh, lecture. And this map shows you uh, most of these major settlements, which, uh, of course, initially were uh, located in the Indus Basin, hence the word Indus civilization. So you have Mohenjo-daro here in Sindh, and you have Harappa in Punjab, which, uh, both of which were identified within just a, year, a year's gap, uh, around 1921-22. Uh, 
And uh, the most striking thing was that uh, similar artifacts were found in those two cities which were 700 kilometers apart. Uh, at that time, no other Harappan site was identified. So it was a major surprise for the archaeologists to find the same shapes of the same uh, seals with this uh, mysterious uh, writing, uh, the same copper and bronze tools, etc., and therefore the same material culture. And uh, initially, you see, there was no carbon dating in 19, back in 1920. So how did they find uh, this chronology that uh, these cities developed from about 2600 BC? Well, because the, the John Marshall, the then Director General of the Archaeological Survey of India, published his findings in an article in 1924, which was published from London. And he published those mysterious Harappan seals. I'll show you some of them later, uh, which uh, were very poorly understood. But they came out in fairly large number from Mohenjo-daro and Harappa. And you know, they are, he called upon scholars to help clarify this mystery. And what happened was that within a week, the very next issue of that magazine, an, an expert Assyriologist, that is to say an expert in the Mesopotamian civilization, said, well, we found a few of those seals back there. In Mesopotamia, and we never knew where they came from because they're not Mesopotamian. That we know because of the Mesopotamian script, you know, the cuneiform script. So we know that they are intrusive objects. But we've never been able to decide where they came from. So now you're telling us that they come from Mohenjo-daro and Harappa, which means that they were contemporary. And the chronology of the Mesopotamian civilization was already fairly well understood. In fact, uh, well, I won't go into, into too many details. Uh, initially, it was thought that uh, this was in the fourth millennium BC, but then later on it was pushed forward to the third millennium BC, as you see here. So 700 years of urban life. And <clears throat> Uh, uh, why, what happened, why did it not continue? I'll come to that at the end of my talk. 700 years during which those cities flourish, and not just these two, but quite a lot of others in Sindh, uh, in Punjab, in Gujarat, Lothal was identified in 1954. Rupar also, Rupar is going to be somewhere here, I can't see very well, um, uh, in, uh, near Chandigarh. Uh, Rupar was also identified very early. But then what happened is that at the time of the partition, you see, in 1947, well, Mohenjo-daro and Harappa went over to Pakistan. It so happens. And uh, Indian archaeologists were suddenly you know, uh, uh, sad that they had those two magnificent cities. And uh, they, started, they started looking more closely on Indian soil. And then, then, then they found here and some of these sites had been uh, identified by a British archaeologist and adventurer called Mark Orelstein, very famous in his days, uh, right from 1941 onward. And they found lots of sites on, along the dry bed of a river, which today is called Ghagar in Haryana, Punjab, and Hakra in this part, which is the Cholistan Desert of Pakistan. It's actually an extension of the Thar Desert. So they found all these sites, and it so happens that this Gagar Hakra civil, uh, river had been identified since 1855 with the lost Sarasvati River of the Rig Veda. There were reasons for this, and I'll come to that later. And uh, there was a consensus among geographers, scientists, uh, archaeologists, and the, the, the Vedic text, because this river is long through uh, uh, the ancient Indian literature, or from the Rig Veda, when the river is full and flowing all the way to the sea, all the way to Mahabharata, where the river has broken down, disappears under the sands of the desert at some locations, but still flows through Kurukshetra. And, um, so therefore, this is the, 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 the Sarasvati River. It had already been established. And, but then the new development was that suddenly hundreds of Harappan sites were uh, uh, found in its basin. And in addition, hundreds in Gujarat. So if I am to summarize, sorry, if I am to summarize uh, the total picture, uh, see, what I've been 
describing now is what is called the mature Harappan or urban phase. Urban phase. We have now something like 1,200 sites uh, scattered over this entire northwest of the uh, urban or mature phase. There are antecedents. I'm not going to, to trouble you with that. We call the early Harappan phase, starting about 3,500 BC, where you know the, the towns. Uh, acquire more and more of the features that will create the Harappan urbanism. And then after 1900 BC, there's a devolution, there's a kind of collapse of the urban order and a scattering of lots of sites which go back to a rural lifestyle. The urban order is no longer maintained. So uh, these are back to village life and uh, there are quite a vast number of them. So you can see the various regions. And uh, if I concentrate only on the, the mature phase now, these are the percentages. Sarasvati Basin, 32%. Uttar Pradesh, uh, all the way to uh, the Ganges, but not across the Ganges. I'll show you later. Uh, 3%, Gujarat, 28%. Pakistan, all together, that is to say, Sindh, Punjab, Baluchistan, few sites in the northwestern provinces also of 37%. Uh, so you can see that this is a, a civilization which has a very wide reach. Uh, actually, about 1 million square kilometers is the present estimate. And, uh, and it was actually much uh, larger in extent than ancient Egypt or Mesopotamia, which were contemporary Bronze Age civilizations. So therefore, immediately one question, uh, uh, you know, uh, occupy the minds of the archaeologists, how is it possible to govern, because there is a government, there is a state structure, such a vast area over, for 700 years at least, uh, standardized pottery, standardized waste systems, standardized writing, standardized sanitation techniques. Uh, all of this is found in all the sites, whether you are in Gujarat, or in Sindh, um, or even UP. So, so they have the, some, some people or groups, people, and we don't know who, you know, decided that these are the features, these are the cultural features they want to, and, uh, and, uh, and this was spread over this entire region. Um, now, the initial thinking was that Mohenjo-daro, which is still today the largest Harappan site, possibly at 300 to 400 hectares, Actually, the full extent is not known. Uh, only 20% of Mohenjo-daro was excavated. And uh, it's not very sure how far it extends. So, but the estimate is three to 400 hectares. And uh, Mohenjo-daro is the most impressive and largest uh, city still today. And it was thought initially that this was the central capital of what was called the Harappan Empire. But, uh, after more and more sites came to light in all the other regions, uh, archaeologists, especially American archaeologists, have proposed that, in fact, this was not a centralized empire. And you see, it would be difficult for, let us say, an emperor sitting here in Mohenjo-daro to pass an order or some instructions that are going to be uh, you know, implemented here in, in Western UP. It's the, I mean, the means of communication do, do not allow this. You have only the bullock cart and the boat for wherever you have rivers. So um, the present thinking is that this was a kind of a confederation of city-states, you know, like ancient Greece, Greece had different city-states. It was not a unified nation in the modern sense. So you had Athens, you had Sparta, and so on. And uh, uh, possibly there were regions with regional capitals uh, for example, uh, here you would have Dholavira in Gujarat, and Gujarat occupies more or less. So there are different names for different subcultures of the Indus civilization. But uh, here you will have Ganwariwala, a huge uh, site of possibly 100 hectares, not yet excavated. Uh, here there is a regional capital in Haryana called Rakighari. I will show it on, on the map, etc. And of course, Harappa here. So uh, this is uh, the, the, the current thinking, without going too much into details, has become a little more complex. And um, uh, the, the, pre the centralized empire, which was an attractive uh, notion, you know, somewhat like the, the old Egyptian empire, doesn't seem to work in the Indian context. Uh, this is a, a, 
uh, timeline showing you, uh, borrowed from uh, the American archaeologist uh, Jonathan Mark Kenoya, showing you Indus here, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and China. So you have in green the pre, uh, I mean, the, the Neolithic phase. In fact, you can see that they are more or less matching across all these civilizations. But in blue, there are some differences. This is what is called the regionalization era, where different regions acquire distinctive characters, but also start building trade networks. And in red, you have the urban phase. So you can see, therefore, that Mesopotamia is the first, uh, in fact, this is called Sumer, Sumerian civilization in, in this particular case, is the first to, to create cities in the world followed closely by ancient Egypt, and third is Indus, last is China. So these are the, uh, some of the Bronze Age civilization of, uh, uh, of the world. And uh, now this is some of the sites, uh, new sites, which I want to show you. I'm not going to show you, in fact, uh, Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa because uh, those are fairly well known. Rather, I'm going to show you sites like Dholavira, which was excavated in the 1990s in the run of Kutch in Gujarat. Uh, Rakigari, I, I will not show you because we don't have yet enough published material, but it's a huge site, unfortunately scattered over several mounds which are occupied by villagers in Haryana, so the archaeologists have difficulty accessing the archaeological material. We will never have, unfortunately, a, a total view of Rakigari uh, because that would mean uh, removing the villages, number one, and number two, uh, what is happening in Haryana, uh, especially of all states, but Punjab also to some extent, is that with the mechanization of agriculture and the exploding, you know, cities, town, urbanism, a lot of Harappan sites are disappearing. In fact, every week, some Harappan site is just raised to the ground by uh, bulldozers. Um, uh, the the the. Uh, sometimes the bricks are recycled, reused, the old Harappan bricks, uh, but uh, the, the sites are just wiped out uh, even before archaeologists can reach out to them. So Rakigari, then uh, this is Farmana, a, a new site also in Haryana. Karanpura is the latest in uh, Rajasthan. We will visit it briefly. And uh, the, this is uh, Birana in Haryana. And we will put briefly see Sanoli just across the Yamuna, just across. You can see that Delhi is this huge, uh, this is a satellite photo in, in false images, uh, false colors, sorry. And uh, this is the Delhi uh, uh, metropolis. Uh, Sanoli is, is not far from it. And uh, this turned out to be an amazing necropolis, that is to say, a, a huge cemetery huge cemetery with uh, hundreds of uh, graves uh, which have been found. And um, a very fascinating site. There must have been a city nearby, but it has not yet been found, and maybe it no, no longer exists, in fact. Uh, Alangirpur is uh, possibly the easternmost Harappan site of mature phase. Uh, you see, we are kind of moving towards uh, the Ganges, but Harappans, mature Harappans, did not cross the Ganges. So far, there is no known Harappan site. There will be late Harappan sites, but that's different. Uh, they stopped at the Ganges for reasons which, well, we don't really know. We can only conjecture. So let's have a look at Birana, which is um, recently excavated in Haryana uh, by the late archaeologist uh, L.S. Rao. And uh, you can see here uh, some of the Harappan structures. What you can see, in fact, first. something possible 2500 BC, they are very shallow. There is not much soil above them, and this is not a natural situation. Uh, this means that a lot of topsoil has been already removed. And this is, this is what, in fact, uh, also I forgot to mention, brick industry. As you well know, uh, in Haryana and in uh, UP especially, there's a huge uh, amount of uh, brick kilns, and those work by constantly removing topsoil. So uh, in the process, uh, a lot of ancient sites are destroyed, not just of the Harappan times, even of later times too. So here you can see a lot of um, habitations. This is a street, uh, a small street. 
Uh, we do not have an overall plan of Birana as far as I know, but quite a few features were identified. You can see that a lot of trenches, this is the, the what is known as the Wheeler's Grid, grid. Uh, in Indian archaeology, uh, uh, Mortimer Wheeler, British archaeologist in the 1940s, uh, imposed this um, system which allowed a very careful stratigraphy, uh, 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 careful reconstruction of the evolution time-wise, period-wise of a site. So this is what is still used uh, here. And uh, in Birana, well, first of all, a, a, a good deal of classical Harappan features, so, for example, pottery here, uh, you find at almost every site, and it is remarkable that uh, this degree of standardization, even for pottery, was imposed across the entire civilization with minor variations here and there. But you have uh, designs like this is the this is known as the intersecting circle design. You have to extend the circles outside. Um, uh, uh, various uh, people people leaves, for example. I think we have one somewhere here. Uh, this is a typical perforated jar uh, of uh, which the Harappans were using everywhere and the funny part is that we still don't know what it was really what purpose it was really uh, used for uh, possibly to make curd or to make some fermented uh, brew or in fact we, did, we were told recently in Kutch that they're still using this kind of perforated jars to you know to wash vegetables they keep vegetables inside and they will dip them vigorously in, in a bucket of water but whether the Harappans, this is the kind of, you see, uh, chemical analysis which has been done abroad. Uh, we know, for example, that the Egyptians and Mesopotamians uh, uh, made beer because, well, the molecules stuck in the inner walls of pottery have been analyzed. But in India, we are lagging behind, and this is one thing that uh, now is slowly picking up the the sciences of archaeology, the, the scientific investigations into archaeo materials. So I hope one day we will have the, the answer to this question. And uh, this are uh, more pottery, but then these are from an earlier phase. This is the early Harappan phase, which is not yet fully urban. It is moving towards urbanism. And again, in many different regions, you have this uh, uh, typical uh, pottery where unlike the classical pottery I was showing you earlier where you have usually black designs painted on a red background or red slip as it is called here the, it is bichrome it is bichrome if you prefer uh, you have the uh, a white reserve for the major designs and uh, the background is still uh, reddish um, and black lines being painted so this got simplified when it moved towards the later mature phase. Uh, these are copper implements, absolutely typical of, of any site. You can see the same in Montaro, in Harappa. You have uh, copper, bronze, bangles, Harappans, loved bangles of any material. Terracotta, I'll show you some in gold later on. Uh, I've bow, uh, faience sometimes. Um, these are arrowheads. These are uh, big gates of uh, bronze which we are used to, uh, to, to dress stone, for example, and various kinds of hooks and needles, etc. So, uh, so Harappans were, and, and these are uh, rings or sets of uh, small bangles. So Harappans were experts at uh, copper bronze metallurgy. What's remarkable here is that they found ways to harden bronze because bronze remains a fairly soft metal. It is harder than copper, but it's still not very hard. And you can't normally use, a, a, if you have pure bronze, that is to say pure copper and pure tin, you would not be able to do much work with such a chisel. It will be blunted immediately. So what they did was that they identified, you know, Probably, of course, empirically, they did not have the chemical knowledge, but they identified certain ores which contain suitable impurities. Impurities like uh, uh, arsenic, nickel, can harden bronze to a large extent. 
So, uh, so this is uh, how they, uh, by careful selection, how they were able to actually make bronze, which was almost of the hardness of iron, almost. This has been measured. Um, well, but in Birana, there is something special going on, which is, and this is exceptional, it's in, in Haryana, Punjab. Even in Sindh, uh, no other site has come up with this Neolithic phase. Uh, this is, uh, and this is in continuity with the later phases. So when they were, archaeologists were digging deeper and deeper, they came upon these pit dwellings which belong to the Neolithic age, uh, where people simply dig a hole in the ground and erect some posts above it, and uh, they, they may thatch, you know, the, 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 uh, the roof provided by the posts. Uh, the very simple dwellings, but these go back normally to five, six, seven thousand uh, BC. And in fact, a few dates have come up, which you can see here, calibrated uh, dates uh, uh, BC, where we are possibly in the sixth and seventh millennium BC. So this is uh, one rare case, um, uh, apart from Mehergar, which I showed you initially in Baluchistan, uh, one very rare case in India where we have antecedents going into the Neolithic. The dates, unfortunately, you see, to have proper carbon-14 chronology, you need actually many more samples. And you need also to have collected them stratigraphically. So you know, for each strata of human occupation, you should have several samples. And then only you will have a very secure chronology. So these dates are a bit tentative. But nevertheless, we do have a Neolithic phase here. So this was a major surprise. Karanpura, which um, was recently excavated by Dr. V. N. Prabhakar, a young Indian archaeologist who actually now has joined IIT Gandhinagar as uh, the first uh, uh, faculty in, in our archaeology uh, center, uh, archaeological sciences center. Before he joined, he was excavating this site in Rajasthan. And uh, you can see here bottom, at the bottom that, again, uh, we have a lot of, of uh, uh, Harappan structures uh, built, all of them with bricks. And uh, you see the, the typical shape of a Harappan house was either square or rectangular. They never built uh, circular houses, except in the later stages when the urbanism collapsed. So, uh, so this is a fairly typical kind of layout. But then here there is something different which is that we are close to the Aravali Hills. It is, uh, it is uh, ha Hanumanga district in Rajasthan, but the southern part of it, which comes close to the Aravali Hills. And this gives you a lot of hard stone material like this one, which allows uh, the Harappans to manufacture a number of stone tools. And in fact, we should not forget that when we say Bronze Age, it's not as if stone material has been abandoned, not at all. The, the, the Harappans continued to use all kinds of stone tools, but let us say they moved away from the big uh, uh, stone axes, for example. They used more refined uh, uh, stone tools, like these, uh, this quern, which was used to crush, possibly to crush uh, spices, uh, the, the, again, ch some kind of uh, uh, chisels. And, uh, uh, but also, very tiny micro blades, uh, which are called microliths, which were used for all kinds of functions, like scraping, like uh, uh, cutting, and so on. And they were, because you see, uh, copper bronze was a relatively rare, precious material in Harappan times. You, when you excavate a site, you don't find masses of it, not at all. Uh, it was difficult to, the, the ore was difficult to procure, and we still don't know exactly where it uh, Harappans got their copper from, Pro possibly from two, three sources, like the Aravali Hills, uh, like Oman. Uh, but, uh, but then stone was a very useful supplement uh, as far as uh, tools were concerned. Uh, now, one unique, and you see, this is always uh, what happens very often when a new site is excavated. Invariably, one site will come up with something unique. And that unique. Uh, artifact or feature is going to suddenly, you know, uh, create a jump in, in our knowledge. Uh, this is unique because uh, on the left uh, uh, you have the, the front part of a Harappan seal, 
the scale below gives you the dimension. It is uh, about one inch, um, uh, not even one inch uh, each side. And uh, it is, why do I call it unique? Well, the, this is Harappan uh, script. In the script, we, it is not deciphered, so there's nothing much to say about it. This is the Harappan unicorn, typical unicorn with a wavy horn. And um, it's a mythical animal. There was no animal uh, compared to, uh, you know, which could be compared to this. Uh, possibly a composite animal with the, the body of a bull but uh, uh, sometimes the front part uh, uh, looks like an antelope in some cases. But here we have this people leaf, you know, the, this uh, uh, the people tree, of course, you know, and it stands in front of the unicorn. We already know that Harappans revered the people tree. Uh, this is very clear from the number of people leaves painted on pottery, for example. But this is the first time that a people leaf has come in the place where normally this is from an another site, Mohanjodaro perhaps. This is the typical design of Indus seals, where you have in front of the unicorn, you have what has been called a ritual stand. And what is this ritual stand? A lot of ink is flown, there are opinions. Some take it to be an incense holder, some take it to be a soma filter, some take it to be a royal emblem. I mean, you know, any number of hypotheses. And unfortunately, uh, it's very difficult to prove or disprove any of them. But then for the first time, and I think this is going to be once it is published, it's not yet published. Once this is published, this is going to start uh, scholars thinking, you know, why is this people leaf suddenly replacing this ritual stand? Uh, this is the kind of thing that um, opens new horizons. Now we move to Sanoli. Sanoli is the site across the Yamuna where hundreds of graves were found, again at a very shallow depth. So in fact, it, it, it was discovered because accidentally a, a farmer, while plowing his field, dug up some bones and some pottery. Uh, and uh, obviously, a lot of topsoil had been lost. And uh, well, uh, when the you know, uh, uh, farmers uh, usually will, uh, uh, in these regions, they will kind of expect uh, to find such things, they know, and in fact, there have been ex instances where uh, they rushed to excavate before any archaeologists could come because they were expecting to find some gold. In fact, there is a there, there is a site in UP called Mandi, Mandi in Western UP, where something like 80 kilos of gold was snatched by uh, villagers before the archaeologists could come, and they could recover only seven, eight kilos, which are lying in Puranakila office of archaeological survey in, in Delhi. And uh, this is, this is a, a tragic because the gold that was uh, snatched away by the villagers was immediately melted. You know, and uh, then, of course, uh, uh, disposed of in various ways. But actually, it's not the gold that is precious. It is all the knowledge of the artifacts which we could have gained, because there are few. There are gold artifacts in many other sites, but usually a very small proportion. So suddenly, such a hoard of uh, gold objects is something absolutely unique. And uh, well, uh, you know, we don't have proper mechanisms in India to prevent this kind of uh, vandalism. So uh, here, luckily, archaeologists could, well, the, 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 luckily, there was almost no gold. Uh, there is a little bit. But the great uh, contribution to fresh knowledge here was a, a deep study of all the uh, uh, methods of burial uh, which, uh, and artifacts buried along the pots, uh, uh, various uh, uh, sheets. And this is a copper antenna sword. Uh, you see so-called antenna because of this uh, shape of the handle here. And this is a unique object. It will appear later in Ganja civilization. I'll show you perhaps next week uh, in what is known the copper hoard culture. But there was so far no direct evidence of a connection between that later copper hoard culture and the Harappan culture. So now this seems to indicate that perhaps the Harappans were the ones who, while moving further eastward into the Ganges Valley, are the ones who were still the, the late Harappans who created the copper hot culture. It remains to be uh, studied in depth, but you see all these 
linkages, evolutions from one culture to another, are the real great uh, question marks that archaeologists try to solve. Uh, this is an example of a symbolic burial here. Uh, this is a, actually a shape. It's, a, it's very small. This is 20 centimeter. You can see the scale, 20 centimeter. And this is a, made of microbeads. And in fact, this is the shape of a human body. So this is a symbolic burial. The person buried here was missing for some reason. We, we don't know why. Uh, Harappans practice symbolic burials quite a lot. You can have, apart from real graves with real skeletons, you can have, for example, empty graves. Uh, I'll show you a major one uh, in a few minutes. You can have uh, uh, urns, big uh, pots containing a few bones. These are known as fractional burials. Or sometimes pots containing nothing at all. So again, they are symbolic burials. So all kinds of modes of burials were practiced. You see, this is a close up. And uh, well, the, this, this, but this kind is unique to this particular site. And, and well, luckily, the, the farmers did not stumble upon this. Some of the, of the uh, uh, buried uh, skeletons were still having bangles, gold bangles, uh, made of pure gold. So uh, this, uh, this is very common, not very common. And it shows this is just to, moving towards the late Harappan phase. It shows that this late Harappan phase was not necessarily urbanism had collapsed, but it was not necessarily a phase where people were poor, for example. It's just that this you know, abstract thing, which we call a state, a government, an administration, could not be maintained for all kinds of reasons, which we'll briefly explore, explore in a few minutes. Now, uh, a few views of uh, Gujarat, but I, actually I'm going to concentrate purely on Dholavira, which is a Harappan city, major Harappan city, located on a small island within the run of Kutch, which today, as you can see from the whiteness of this satellite photo, is a big expanse of salt. But it's, it's a salty marsh during the monsoon, and it's just salt during the dry season. But in Harappan times, it was navigable. There was, it was a branch of the sea. This has been well established, which means that this was an island, but Dolavira was probably a port. And uh, why set up a port here in this remote region? Probably to control, to control the resources, especially in terms of semi-precious stones, shell, and other materials which Gujarat had to offer. And which was not available in Sindh, for example. Sindh, Mohenjo-daro is, uh, uh, you know, within a classic alluvial plain where you have no stone at all, just clay and clay and clay. So here there is stone, and this city of Dholavira, as you will see, is built uh, with a lot of stone, also bricks uh, over the, 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 the stone foundations. What's remarkable is that it uh, has three areas, the upper city in blue, the middle city in pink here, and in, in yellow, this lower city. Now, we'll return to this planning in another lecture, uh, uh, also about the water management, because this is a very dry, arid zone. How do you, today there is no city uh, on this island, not even a town, only hamlets survive on this island. But the Harappans were able to keep a city thriving there for six or seven centuries. So how did they manage this in terms of water supply? We will explore that in a future lecture. Massive stone construction here. Uh, this is, in fact, a sentinel room within uh, a, a fortification wall of the upper city. And you can see here interesting, very interesting segments of pillars, uh, which are highly polished uh, stone. So they excelled at uh, stone working. And uh, this is uh, the one of the gates uh, to the, what the excavator, Dr. Aris Bisht, called the castle, where the, the, the rulers probably lived. This is the most fortified area. And you can see the massiveness of, of the whole construction. Uh, it's very impressive, very impressive. So then this is the middle town, uh, which was at the center of the plan where you have a lot of habitations, all of them, again, rectangular. And uh, uh, pottery, same classical shapes which you find elsewhere, 
this is again our perforated jar. This is a so-called dish on stand, which was used uh, quite a lot in, uh, in funerary structures, in graves and tombs. And well, the Ravira came up with these are standard, fairly standard features, standard uh, shapes of pots. But the Ravira came up with several unique features, uh, which I'm going to show you briefly. These are the, again, standard uh, 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 mid, uh, copper bronze uh, artifacts. Uh, which we saw more or less at uh, the places. This is a sp ceremonial spearhead, spearhead, uh, which which would not have made a very good weapon because they were pretty blunt. They were probably the ones that the sentinels were, you know, using to guard. It was more symbolic than uh, uh, actual uh, uh, for actual, uh, you know, warfare, for instance. And um, these are. Other standard artifacts which you find in many sites. These at the top is a series of Harappan weights, which we will revisit in another talk. Very st highly standardized weights across the entire civilization. The same even in Oman, in Kuwait, uh, similar weights because the Harappans were trading there, as I'll show you in a minute, uh, were found. And some of these stone tools. I'm sorry. Some of these stone tools I was mentioning earlier, like these micro blades uh, usually made of chert. Chert is a very hard type of stone. So these are some of the pillar segments which I mentioned and uh, they really created this technique of building pillars <coughs> in a segmented fashion. There are many advantages of course you can adjust the height you want and um, uh, the, it is of course easier to transport also. <coughs> And in the <coughs> northern gate of the castle, this unique inscription of 10 huge characters, each character being about 30 centimeters in height, 30 centimeters. Uh, so there are, this is again undeciphered. And this was probably these characters, which are a kind of uh, uh, mineral material here we are certainly embedded on a massive plank. Now the plank, the wood has long decayed, and that plank was probably hanging at the top of the gate, which I showed you earlier. The dimensions fit. So what was it that, uh, see, this is uh, the type of object that suddenly changed our thinking, because initially, all Harappan script was on tiny seals. So there were scholars who said, well, Harappan script was elitist. It was just an elite that could read and write it. But then suddenly you have this huge signboard which you hang in a way that all the middle town below is going to be able to read it. So you know you expect at least some people to be able to, to read the script. So this changes our perspective of the Indian script. Indian script. And unique object, quite unique, <coughs> a Harappan inscription on stone. This is uh, extremely rare. And Mohanjodaro has none. But again, Mohanjodaro has no stone at all. Uh, but uh, Dhoravira, two such uh, stones were found. And a, a huge, quite a lot of graves, I have no time to show you the whole uh, burial system of Dhoravira, but there is a colossal grave which has kind of uh, radial projections made of stone, which you can see from the top, uh, like a kind of spoked wheel. And uh, <clears throat> enormous, so we can assume that it was for a very special character, perhaps a king. But then when, when they excavated and uh, you know, dug from the center, they reached uh, an a underground chamber, which was covered by these uh, stone slabs. And uh, the big surprise was that the chamber was empty. There was, <laughs> there was no skeleton. So exactly what does it mean, <laughs> we don't know. Was it again a symbolic burial? Had it been reopened later and the buried uh, you know, uh, uh, person been removed? We will never know, perhaps. <clears throat> well, this is just to show you that uh, the, these, these are the pillar segments from Dolavira, which are excavated from a quarry a few kilometers away from Dolavira. And these segments travel from Dolavira to Mohenjo-daro and beyond to Harappa. They are found here. This is from Harappa, here. So, so you can see that the, 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 the networks work very well. 
and they don't mind transporting. Of course, here this will be through boats traveling on the Indus, not through Gulakad, uh, but they don't mind transporting material uh, far away. Now, I'll just take um, uh, five to ten minutes to show you uh, some of the disciplines, scientific disciplines of archaeology where new findings are coming all the time and uh, which are the area where we are lagging behind in India. So there are still new developments taking place. And you know, this is actually, uh, you know, in, uh, today in India you are a, a, an MA in archaeology, but in fact it should, be, it should become MSc in archaeology because archaeology is more and more of a science than uh, you know, a text-based, uh, scholarly-based uh, uh, approach. I, ideally, we need both. But it is uh, very much scientific. For example, this is by Dr. Krishnan of uh, MS University Baroda, a highly uh, technical study of ceramics, pottery, from uh, Birana, where all the texture of every pot will be analyzed and compared with the different soils available in the region. You see, so you have various alluvial uh, soils. And uh, then all these will be matched with the various pots found there so that the, the, the origin of the material will be found. And sometimes you find a pot whose constitution is not compatible with any of the surrounding soils. So then you can understand that someone brought this pot you know, from far away. So these kind of studies are beginning. And uh, there's so much more that we can understand uh, through that. Harappans had many te technological secrets, the one of which is the drilling of these long carnelian beads. Carnelian is a kind of agate, semi-precious stone. And you see, the, some of them measure three, four, even five inches in length. And you know, if I, if I were to do such a bead, even with the electric drill and all the modern machinery, and I lengthwise, without breaking the bead, not much. So Harappans were able, with some wastage, because the workshops have been found, and we know that once in a while they did break, but they, have been, they, they had the, the technological secret of drilling those beads lengthwise and exporting them all the way to Mesopotamia, where they were highly prized by the royal families there. And these are, in fact, see, Ur, Ur is in Mesopotamia, and you have these, uh, these Harappan beads. So how did they do it? Well, they created drill bits, and then they had some hand drills comparable with, I mean, uh, you know, our uh, older generation might how carpenters long ago were using bow kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 drills uh, with the, you can, you can swing the bow and your drill is going to rotate. Uh, but they made those drills of a certain material which has been called ernestite in honor of a British archaeologist, Ernest Mackay. And the big thing here is that this material is still mysterious. Uh, the shapes have been studies, studied. Uh, the, the way the drilling took place was studied by taking silicone impression of the core, the, the drilled core of the bead, and therefore recreating the whole drilling process. Uh, this was done especially by uh, uh, Mark Kenoya in the US. Uh, various uh, steps, you know, stepwise drilling, drilling from both sides, and so on. Uh, but then at the end of the day, at the, and these are the actual drill. This one is from Dolavira. You can see how, you know, the perfection of the shape of the drill. And, uh, and this is just stone, but we do not know yet. This is the material. But the, there has not been enough min mineralogist study to decide whether this is a naturally occurring stone. And so far, it has not been found anywhere or whether it was a synthetic stone, because the Harappans excelled at uh, uh, you know, heating, uh, powdering, reheating, consolidating materials of, of various kinds of stone. That is how they made faience, for example. Faience is a synthetic material sometimes called protoglass. It has more or less the structure of glass, but it's not transparent. And they made it. They didn't do glass, but they did faience. So this is the Einstein, and uh, I think within a few years, we will finally know where and how they, they got this material that allowed them to have a very hard uh, uh, drill bits to drill those uh, long uh, beads. And uh, this is just uh, to show you the kind of study going on. 
in terms of metal and provenance of metal. This is various, uh, you see, signatures, identifications of, uh, you have the colors corresponding here, blue is here, etc. green from Rajasthan is here. And this characterization of various copper ores is made on the basis of presence of uh, uh, isotopes of lead. Lead is a common impurity in copper, copper ore. And these, these and other isotopes, other impurities, will kind of give a signature for the particular ore. And then, of course, the whole work, and this has been done by Kenoya and his uh, student, uh, Randall Law, consists in identifying, building a database for all the various regions, and then trying to, uh, to, to match them with the existing samples. So this is a work in progress. Uh, quickly, this is, no, sorry. This is a, one of these very you know, unique finds that suddenly change a perspective. And these are some threads which were found embedded in a microbead of steatites. Harappans love to make those microbeads. In fact, we don't know how they made them. You can see the scale, one millimeter in length, one millimeter diameter. This is the size of the microbead. And there is a hole in the middle. And some of them came with these fibers. So they, they, they were thought to be cotton, but usually cotton does not survive in the Northwest climate. And there's very, very, very few fibers have been found. Electron microscope and did other tests, discovered that this was not cotton, but silk. And therefore, the Harappans were practicing silk harvesting of, of course, wild silk, they, they did not probably, uh, you know, uh, did uh, sericulture in the, in the way we understand it today, but they were harvesting silk and using it at least for threading, possibly more. So, you know, this changes the whole perspective of the, the silk history because we were told previously that it was China that invented uh, silk production uh, much later, and uh, therefore we find now that the Harappans uh, uh, were producing silk. Whether this uh, uh, silk production remained in continuity in later stages of Indian civilization, we don't know at all yet. It is possible that the, this technique was lost and rediscovered later. That all, also can happen. And uh, uh, very funny kind of uh, findings, like the presence of drilled teeth. As you know, as you saw, Harappans were drilling bees but then they were using similar drill bits to drill teeth and possibly to, re to relieve toothache. So this has been studied in uh, England by some expert uh, dentists, uh, scientists of dentistry, and they found that there were very regular holes being drilled uh, in um, quite a few teeth, and uh, which were done and they experimented. In fact, here you see a poor fellow on the left where uh, uh, there is an attempt to recreate you know, the technique that Harappans might have used. So, and, and, the, and please note that the first evidence dates back to Mehergar before the Indus uh, stage, about 6,000 BC. 6,000 BC in the Neolithic, people were practicing tooth drilling. With what results is very hard to say, but uh, this is what they did. Now, uh, there are lots of other techniques I think I'm going to uh, skip this is about uh, uh, analyzing the isotopes in the enamel of teeth uh, because the, ena uh, the, the whatever isotopes we are going to accumulate in our enamel actually come from the food we eat and therefore there will be a signature of the particular region where this food was available. So this research has been done by Dr. Prabhakar again uh, in, in Sanoli, that uh, huge necropolis. And he's been able to trace the isotopes, you know, uh, region-wise. And uh, he find that in this limited study, this has to be amplified, but this is the kind of scientific development that can f ultimately give us precious information on the, the life of the society. He finds that actually people here were basically locals, except for a, a, a few odd samples. Uh, they, they corresponded, the enamel, the composition of their tooth enamel corresponded to the, the, the food and soil nature that was available there. So these are studies in progress. And lastly, I'll take just two minutes to 
uh, show you the interface of the Harappans uh, uh, with all these civilizations, all of these in here. Uh, Magan, which is Oman, Dilmun, which is Kuwait, uh, Elam is part of Iran, Mesopotamia, of course, is Iraq, and some of Central Asia also. Harappan presence is found in all of these. Harappan weights, Harappan pottery sometimes, the beads, they're found there. Strangely, very, very, very little of the, these, of, of, of artifacts of these civilizations are found back in the Indus. And uh, let me simply show you that uh, we have evidence from Mesopotamian tablets that there was a trade going on with Meluha. Meluha is the name that probably was applied to the Indus civilization. This is the consensus among most scholars in Mesop Mesopotamian tablets. And here we have a tablet where, you see, this is a script. The script is here. And this caption tells us that there is an interpreter from Meluha meeting the king. So this is probably the interpreter here. So uh, they, 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 were, they were people who were able to speak both languages and uh, who were intermediaries, of course, in the trade. And uh, this is how uh, uh, the reconstitution of the uh, naval uh, you know, uh, network, which uh, the Harappans used, first of all, following from Gujarat, following uh, the shore, the, shore the, the, the coast, and then coming back across the Arabian Sea. Uh, these are sites which are being explored now in Oman, where a lot of Harappan artifacts have been found. And finally, finally, let me end with, why is this moving? With one attempt, you see, archaeologists always try to replicate, recreate ancient techniques, whether it is bead making, bead drilling, uh, whatever, weaving pots. A lot of Harappan pots have been made today uh, by archaeologists following the Harappan techniques. That is fairly straightforward. But then, to show the nav navigational skills of the Harappans, uh, how to rebuild a Harappan boat or ship. And they, f they you know, compiled information from many, many documents, especially on the Mesopotamian side. And they found that they, they, they would have assembled bundles of reed, you know, and the, uh, uh, tied with cane. And then, of course, you need to waterproof this. So there was caulking done with bitumen. Bitumen is a naturally occurring form of tar. And uh, Harappans, in fact, used it also for waterproofing, like the, the, the great bath of Mohenjo-Daro was waterproof with bitumen. So in 2005, uh, archaeologists like Maurizio Tozzi of Italy, uh, Gregory Possel of uh, uh, the US, tried to recreate and they said, we will make a Harappan boat, and we will sail from Oman all the way to Lothal. You see, we, to Gujarat, at least, because Lothal today is no longer accessible uh, through the sea. So this is what it looked like. And um, this is the boat starting on its journey from, from Oman, but then uh, something was wrong. And the first, very first day, it sank. Of course, there was a, bo a proper boat, a, a ship accompanying them. Um, and uh, those uh, archaeologists were there. Uh, something in the waterproofing uh, and the fact that their structure was somehow too flexible. All these reeds made a too flexible boat, and it ended up taking water. So uh, they want to come back to it sometime. Uh, we will see. But uh, this is the kind of uh, you know, researchers that archaeologists uh, uh, love to explore, and uh, basically this is um, so. So the end. Well, the end. I think uh, I will come back to it because it's already late. I will. Uh, in fact, we will talk about this uh, in on fr uh, on Friday during the discussion on the Aryan invasion theory, and uh, we will come back to to this. I'll stop for today here.